I remember listening to Howard Marshall, well before the war, it'd be about 1937, I suppose. It was in the days when I was more interested in playing cricket than listening to it. But uh, the memory is absolutely distinct, and I remembered it for many years after I started to do commentary and realised just all the changes that had happened in the game and in commentary and, of course, in broadcasting. John Arlott was to become more celebrated as the voice of cricket than even that pre-war pioneer, Howard Marshall. He started in 1946. I just achieved my aspiration of becoming a poetry producer in the BBC. And I was in the Eastern Service and we had a programme planning meeting in January 1946. And the head of service, Donald Stevenson, said, isn't there an Indian cricket team, he said, with a rather distasteful tone? coming this summer and I said yes there is oh yes he said I remember from your interview you're keen on cricket when do they start I said the first Wednesday in May mm, where he said I said what's that yeah, where do they go then I said Oxford he said how do you know I said because I've got the fixture list in my office he said have you ever done a cricket broadcast yet said I stretching the truth because all I'd ever done was a, a 15 minute talk about Hambledon but uh, he said would you like to do it and I thought someone had turned me upside down. It was impossible. So I gasped out, yes. He said, can you do your programs and that as well? And I said, yes. So he sent me off to do them. And when I got back on the Wednesday, the head of service said, if you want to continue, you can. You did it, but you must get your programs done. So I missed, I think, about five programs that summer. I ended up so broke it wasn't true. But, you know, for the others, it was no great translation. They, they were somewhere about there. But for me, it was a sort of seventh heaven to be watching cricket and talking about it and being paid for it. You've got to be a natural talker because there's a time when a fast bowler walks back to his mark when you've got a devil of a lot of filling in to do. It is a contemplative game, you see. It is a game that produces art, painting, writing, poetry, and I suppose commentary is just a step down from that. By 1948, when Don Bradman brought one of the greatest Australian sides to England, Arlott was part of the regular team which broadcast ball-by-ball -ball commentary to Australia and large slices of it to the domestic audience. Australia won at Trent Bridge and at Lords, and by drawing the third test at Old Trafford ensured that they retained the Ashes. But the fourth test at Headingley is one of the most celebrated of all matches. It started well for England as Len Hutton and Cyril Washbrook blunted the attack of Linwall and Miller with a large opening partnership until the second new ball was due. Chester indicates that he's about to take it, shows it with a warning and paternal air to Hutton and Linwall seizes it and he's just going to bowl with a new ball now from the grandstand end. Goes through the usual Linwall bout of physical jerks. The shirt is now comfortably loose and it fills with wind as he comes up now from the grandstand end. Bowls the first ball to Hutton, a magnificent outswinger. <laughs> Hit for four. Now that was hit on the half volley by Hutton for four and a difficult ball it was to cope with. Over it, its last two yards it went eight inches. It went off the line of the middle and off, clean outside the off stump. And Hutton right over it, hit it firmly past the somnolent Toshak at point for four runs. And now here comes Lindwall again to Hutton. And that was a magnificent inswinger that bowled him off his pad.
that was another magnificent ball. It's got rid of Hutton, and he is out. Bold Lindwall. 81. Hutton, Bold Lindwall, 81. England are 168 for one. On the final day of that great test match, England declared, setting Australia 404 to win in just under a full day's play, a seemingly impossible task. But a stand of 301 for the second wicket between Arthur Morris and Don Bradman took Australia to the brink of victory. Morris was out for 182, and Bradman made 173 not out, his fourth test century at Leeds. John Arlott described the end of the match. For 55 runs, he bowled six maidens, and although it wasn't policy to use a pace bowler all day long, whenever he was called upon, he did his job on a wicket that, if it suited any bowler, certainly suited a spinner. There was no leg spinner in the England side except Hutton, or Compton when he bowls his left arm, Googly, and neither of those looked good enough to worry great batsmen who were bent on taking up England's challenge of fast runs. They took it up and they met it. Well, now Cranston comes to meet to bowl to Harvey. Harvey picks him off his toes, Hits him to the long arm boundary, and he's stolen a stump, and the ball's crossed the boundary, and it's all over. And we greet our general overseas listeners at the moment that the great crowd surges all across the road despite the police all across the ground despite the policeman forms a corridor for the players as they go in and australia won the fourth test at headingley by seven wickets two and a half weeks later at the oval don bradman played his last test match rex alston described the scene as he came in to bat here's the applause for bradman as he comes in reception the whole crowd is standing and the England team are joining in and led by Yardley three cheers for the Don as he gets to the wicket Yardley went up to Bradman and shook him by the hand and then called for three cheers and now the crowd settled down again they've got 40 minutes 40 minutes more left for play and uh, Bradman is now taking guard Hollis is going to bowl at him and John Arlott shall describe the first ball. So come on, John. Well, I don't think I'm as deadly as you are, Rex. I don't expect to get a wicket, but it's rather good to be here at when Don Bradman comes into bat his last test. And now here's Hollies to bowl to him from the Vauxhall end. He bowls, Bradman goes back across his wicket and pushes the ball gently in the direction of the House of the Houses of Parliament, which are out beyond mid-off. It doesn't go that far. It merely goes to Watkins at silly mid-off. No run, still 117 for one. Two slips, a silly mid-off and a forward short leg close to him as Hollies pitches the ball up slowly and he's bowled. Bradman, Bold, Hollies, not. Bold, Hollies, not. And what do you say under those circumstances? How, I wonder if you see a ball very clearly in your last test in England, the ground where you played out some of the biggest cricket of your life and where the opposing team have just stood around you and given you three cheers and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. 
I wonder if you really see the ball at all. Anyway, Bradman went forward. It was Holly's googly. It clean bowled him, groping right down the pitch. And he was just beaten all the way. I think he was completely out of his crease and would have been stumped if it hadn't hit the wicket. He didn't seem to make any attempt to get back. He knew it had bowled him. Australia are 117 for two in reply to England, 52. Despite the failure of Bradman, Australia were heading for an innings victory. Bill Johnston's bowling and nothing in a way could be more fitting than if Johnston were to take the last wicket of this series. The most improved bowler of, of the series and a man of whom I think we shall hear very, very much in the future. Probably always be a better bowler in England than in Australia. The greater humidity of our atmosphere makes him very dangerous indeed. Now here he comes from the Vauxhall end and he bowls to Hollies and Hollies swings him hard and high, everyone stolen stumps and Morris has caught him. It took an awful long time to come down. Every stump was out of the ground and every bale was in a player's pocket before Arthur Morris made that catch. And, and England are all out 188. All out 188. Barnes has got a stump. Neither Young nor Hollies has. And now, uh, yes, they both got bats. And as a small boy wants their autographs, he's being removed by two policemen, uh, by a policeman and an official. Umpire Davies has got a stump. Loxton's got a bail. And now in com almost complete silence, these last two batsmen, Jack Young, not out three, Eric Hollies, not Court Morris, both Johnston come back into the pavilion and the fifth test and the England-Australia series of 1948 is all over. Australia retain the ashes, win the series by four tests to none, the first time I believe that that's ever been done and the players are now all back in the pavilion and the crowd is coming slowly out from its seat and round towards, on one side at least, round towards the pavilion. In the English winter which followed, the MCC went to South Africa with John Arlott as the BBC's man on the tour. He had some thrilling finishes to describe. In the first test in Durban, for instance, England needed 128 to win. 121 for eight. Seven balls, seven runs. Bad light, steady rain, and Lindsay Tuckett bowling with only two men near the wicket. A slip and a silly mid-on. Balls to Gladwin. Gladwin's white right. It's up in the long field. It's over the field from his head and it's gone for four. 125 for eight. One, two, five for eight. Three to win. Two wickets to fall. Six balls to go. Cliff Gladwin, who hits a catch every ball. And if he goes, Doug Wright follows him and he only gets one ball and hits a certain catch off that. 125 for eight. Three wickets to fall. The last over. Tuck it to bowl the third ball. Bowls to Gladwin, a bumper. Off Gladwin's wrist, the long leg. 126. They don't take one for the throw. 126 for eight. Two to win. That was the third ball. If this goes five balls, there'll be no commentator left. And Beds are touching his toes then, I think, for mental relaxation. Tuck it, wiping the bat on the ball, the ball on the towel. The hills of North Durban completely hidden by rain, which is falling steadily round the box. And Tuck it bowls to Beds and Beds swings. And Dudley North has stopped. He's going to try to run him out. And he's hit him, but he hasn't run him out. 126 for eight. Quick return there from North when they were thinking about a run, a scuttled recovery, and he even forgot to limp. And he had a blow like a ton of bricks on the left shin at the start of this inning. Tuck it to Bedser from the Umgani end. Two to win. And he's wiped at it. And it hit him in the stomach. And it was passing off foot over. And 5,000 people appealed, and I don't blame them. Three balls. Three balls to go. Two runs. Two wickets. The last over, once started, must be finished. Tuck it from the, the Umgani end to Alec Bedsar. A bumper, edged, out to cover. They're gonna run, they'll never make it. Oh. They, they've missed it, there's a lot. They don't take the overthrow, 127 for eight. 127 for eight. They didn't dare try the overthrow. I don't think either of them has got sufficient nerve or sufficient wind. 
and I certainly have no wind at all. Two balls, one run, two wickets. And the two wickets could go just as easily as the one run could come. It's a tie. One to win. It's a tie and two balls to go. And Lindsay Tuckett's got to bowl. And he's bowling to Gladwin. And it's a bouncer. It's outside the leg stump. And Wade, in an attitude of prayer, prevents it from being buys. And the next one, they've got to run whatever happens. Tuckett from the Umgani end to Cliff Gladwin. One run to win and one ball to go. Tuckett to Gladwin. And he's knuckled it, and they're running, and Bencher isn't run out, and they've won on the last ball of the last over. And any sane man would tell you that England have won by two wickets. If you wanted to put it in a book, no one would ever believe it. It belongs to a novel, not wisdom. Never in all my life have I imagined that I would see such a finish. Uh, carrying Gladwin in now, and anyone else who, who's got the strength even to be carried. And McCarthy. And this wicket now looks even worse than it did a minute ago, because half Durban is running on it. All juvenile Durban. It's just the most incredible finish. And for anyone who's got the patience to listen, Gladwin make, made seven, and neither I, Gladwin, the bowler, or anyone else could tell you how he made them. Bedsa made one. Oh, I do know the last one of Gladwin's was off both knuckles. And McCarthy took, what did he take? It's his afternoon, six for 44. Three drawn matches followed, but in the final test at Port Elizabeth, South Africa set England 172 to win in only 95 minutes. The challenge was taken up. 150 for five. England was 22 runs in a quarter of an hour after that Gladwin six, but there's not much forcing batting to come. In fact, there are not an awful lot of wickets to spare anyway, because they've all got to hit like fury. Man to bowl to Gladwin, pitched up. Gladwin forward defensive, and it only goes a couple of yards. They run a gallop single as Kieran McCarthy stretching further than you think a man could stretch. Gets the ball to Billy Wade. Jack Crap gets the bowling. 1-5-1 one, one for 5. 21 to win. 21 to win, 5 wickets to fall. And now Tufty Man bowling from this end where we are, the swimming pool end. Slow left arm round the wicket. Comes up now, bolts the crap, who goes down the wicket. Miss hits him, sends it off the inside edge. Pass Rowan at Salim it on. They get one, they're going to, they're contemplating a second, but a very quick run in and pick up by Cheatham sends them back. Only one, one, five, two, 20 wanted. 20 now in 14 minutes. 20 in 14 minutes. Tufty man to bowl to Gladwin. North at long on, tuck it at long off. Cheatham deep extra cover. The three men that count. Gladwin's down the wicket. It's lofted hard and high. Tuckett's running here under it, and he's got it. He's held it. I couldn't see him, but he's held it. Gladwin's out. One, five, two for six. And here comes Billy Griffith now, passing Gladwin on his way out. Running out. One, five, two for six. England wants 20. Four wickets to fall. About 13 minutes to go. And... Billy Griffith, who hit a four in the first innings, and that's one of the first fours Billy's hit for a very long time. First one in a test match, I'm sure, since his 100 against the West Indies last year. They ran a single while it was crossing. Cramp's got the bowling. Manda bowled to him. Eric Rowan steals up close at silly mid-on. North, long off. Tuck it long on. Bowls to Cramp. Cramp chips it. Down past slip. And Griffith makes good his ground. One, five, three... 19 wanted, 13 minutes, man bowling, and he's a bowl to Griffith. And for the pull, for the agricultural pull, he's stationed two mid-wickets. Two mid-wickets on the leg side, and one man out deep behind him, a long on, he bowls to Griffith, Griffith goes down, swings up the full toss, and he's clean bowled. One, five, three, four, seven. One, five, three, four, seven. Three wickets to fall. Here comes the next man, Alan Watkins. He's 20 yards out before Billy Griffith can get in, and this can now go either way. It may be that 
I ought at this juncture to try to read the scorecard. Well, here it is. Hutton and Washbrook, 58 for the first wicket. Hutton stumped Wade, bowled Rowan, 32. Washbrook caught Athel Rowan, bowled man, 40. Compton caught Cheatham, bowled Athel Rowan, 42. Man caught Dawson, bowled man, 2. Bedser caught Norse, bowled Rowan, 1. Gladwin caught Tuckett, bowled man, 19. Griffith, bowled man, naught. And there's the first ball to Alan Watkins, pushed out defensively on the offside. Man goes after it, embraces Cramp as he realises it's unnecessary, and is back. Hutton, Washbrook and Compton started it. Now it remains for these men to finish it. Next one to Watkins, top square. Away past short third man, Bruce Mitchell. They get one, they get a second as he turns, picks it up over at the far end. One, one, five, five is it? One, five, five for seven. One, five, five for seven. 17 runs, two wickets, 11 or 12 minutes. I can't quite see the pavilion clock, and that's the one that counts. Not all the Greenwich mean time in the world. It seems to me to show 10. 10 minutes by the pavilion clock. 17 runs, three wickets, Athel Rowan bowling, and Rowan's figures, have we got them? Rowan's figures, three for 61. Three for 61 off nine overs, and that's hitting. He's going round the wicket to Jack Crapp. Two left-handers now, so there'll be no change of the field. Crapp swings hard and high on the leg side, and, oh, first bounce to the fieldsman. They take a single. Watkins makes his ground, 156. One, five, six, four, seven. 16 wanted. 16 wanted, three wickets to fall. Watkins and Crapp in, but both of them hitting, so they might go at any moment. Now, Rowan comes up, bowls to Watkins. Watkins turns it on the leg side. A single down to McCarthy up fine legs. One, five, seven for seven. Three to Watkins, 14 to Crap. One, five, seven for seven. 15 to win. Three wickets to fall. Just under 10 minutes to go. We'll try and get this pavilion clock in line now. Just turned up from 10 to. He bowls to Crap. Rowan does, who chops him to Mitchell at short third man. Retreated from slip and no run. The field, a slip, a short third man, a cover, deep extra cover, mid off, mid on rather deep, a long on, a deep square leg, and a fine leg as Rowan comes in, bowls to Crap. Crap pushes him away again on the offside for another single. Watkins comes down, and this recalls to me an ancient test match in England when there was plenty of time to do it then, as there isn't now. And as Wilfred Rhodes, later to go in first for England, came in last man, George Hurst said we'll get him in singles. Well, now, Rowan to Watkins. Appeal for LBW, rising over the top, I think. Given out. No ball, sorry. As the umpire's hand went, I thought he'd given him out. It's a no ball. No ball. Hit Watkins right on the top of the pads. Flew over his head. They took a single. One, five, nine. Thirteen wanted. Row into crap. Crap down the wicket. Miss hits. Away on the offside. A single. Leg by. One, sixty. One, sixty. England, one hundred and sixty for seven. Twelve to win. About eight, seven or eight minutes to go. Athel Rowan bowling to Watkins. Outside the off stump, Watkins tries to cut, misses. Wade takes very well indeed. Rowan's making pace off the wicket. He's keeping a fairly low flight. He's not throwing anything up. But he's digging in. He's got three for 61. And he's coming in now to bowl to Alan Watkins again. He bowls to him. Watkins turns the ball off his body. Down on the on side. McCarthy comes again from fine leg and field. And it's a single. One, six, one. Eleven wanted. Eleven wanted. End of Rowan's over. Man has taken three for 53 in nine overs. And now he's going to bowl again, I think, from the town end in failing light. You might possibly get away with an appeal, but I doubt it. Nevertheless, it's a bit dim. Light's a bit dim. Uh, Dudley North coming out now to deep extra cover to Watkins. Rowan, three for 66 in 10 overs, only five runs off that over. Man to Watkins, outside the off stump, hits hard on the offside. Crap and man run foul of one another on the offside again. But the ball goes out to deep extra, where McCarthy, with that appallingly long stride of his, makes a great stretch for it. And the ring on the offside now, a ring of five men, a wide ring, attempting to cut off the one as man comes in. Both the crap goes down the wicket, hammers hard, fielded again by Dudley North at extra cover. Only a single. One, six, three. One, six, three for seven. One, six, three for seven. Nine to win. About five minutes to go. Man bowls to Watkins, who goes back onto his stumps and plays a defensive stroke to Eric Rowan at mid-arm. This is going to be mighty close. 
If these two go, there's not very much to rely on. Now, man comes in, bowls again to Watkins. Pitch well out to him, Watkins forward. A miss hit, half edge, half pad, or entirely pad. But anyway, it's a single to slip. 164, eight, eight runs, three wickets, five minutes. And if Tufty Man feels as cool as he looks, he's the only man on the ground who does. A leisurely stroll back to bowl, and in again, slow left arm over the wicket. The crab who goes down the wicket, hits it hard and high, right over Dudley Norse's head, and it bounced on the line, it's four. This looks as if it may be it, 168. You just wouldn't believe this was the Jack Crab who batted so doggedly at Cape Town. 168 for seven, four wanted, and there must be another over to come. Man to bowl to Jack Crab, slow left round the wicket, he bowls him a quicker one, Crab down the wicket, hammers it away here on the offside. Oh, a very good stop by Norse on the run, a brilliant one. They've run a couple, it looked a certain four, and a perfect pick up by Dudley Norse. That's 170, 170 for seven, England, after a declaration by Norse that seemed impossible. 108 to score in 108 an hour, 171 in 95 minutes on a turner. And now man comes in, bolster crap, who goes down the wicket, throws hard and high again, and that's the end of the game. It's won, and Jack Crap took all three stumps from the far end. The two batsmen crossed and pinched three stumps apiece from the opposite end, and are running in now, embracing one another. I never thought this could happen twice in a series. England win by three wickets. It's an in Incredible finish. They've done this with five minutes to spare. They made 170 runs in 90 minutes. 170 runs in 90 minutes. A rate of 100, and, almost 120 an hour. On a turner with Athel Rowan and Tufty Man, believe me, bowling very well indeed.